Good morning. It is my habit and tradition to uh, open hearings that I chair with a prayer, so please join me with a, a quick prayer. Definitely, Father, we come to you this morning humble, understanding that uh, we desperate need of your wisdom and guidance and discernment. Lord, in particular, we pray for the families and those affected by the bombing in Manchester last night. A clear reminder of how dangerous this world is. And we ask your comfort and healing for those involved in that horrific uh, experience. We ask that you be with us this morning as we try to find the truth, try to find answers that our American public wants, and we ask for your guidance and wisdom. These things in your, your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning. The committee will come to order. I'd like to welcome our witness, the former director of the Central Intelligence Agency, John, Agency, John Brennan. Thank you, Mr. Brennan, for uh, agreeing to come visit with us this morning. We appreciate that. As you're aware, this, uh, like I mentioned my prayer, horrific attack last night uh, in Manchester uh, Arena in, U in the U.K. I like to, uh, we obviously offer up our prayers and sympathies to the families of the deceased and injured. And while there are many unanswered questions, last night's unspeakable tra tragedy reminds us the crucial role our uh, intelligence agencies play in protecting our homeland. I'm confident that our IC agencies are doing all they can to assist our U.K. partners at this time. I'd now like to remind our members and the witnesses that this uh, morning's uh, portion is an open hearing. Uh, there will be a closed session uh, in the Intelligence uh, Committee spaces immediately following today's open hearing that will allow members and the witness to discuss classified information. To our guests in the audience, welcome. We appreciate uh, the public and the media's interest in the committee's important work. We expect a proper decorum will be observed at all times and disruptions during today's proceedings will not be tolerated. This time, I'd like our witness to stand and raise your right hand, please. I do solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you will give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Brennan, again. I uh, appreciate it. I now recognize, recognize myself for uh, five minutes. Uh, as you know, the committee has an incredible, incredible responsibility to the American public. We are charged with getting to the bottom of the facts regarding Russians' involvement in the 2016 election and what, if any, steps were taken by the United States government to prevent such interference in our election. It's my hope that your testimony today will assist both ours and the American public's understanding of the facts surrounding the Russian active measures during our last presidential campaign. As a former director of the CIA, you have a vital knowledge of the events and activities of last year, and were a key player in the preparation of the intelligence community assessment regarding Russian activities and intentions in recent U.S. elections published in January 2017. You're one of a handful of former U.S. government employees that can assist this committee with understanding the events that took place and the judgments rendered by the intelligence committee regarding, community regarding those matters. In particular, I'm hopeful you will discuss your understanding of the ongoing Russia threat and the actions that were taken by the Obama administration to counter it. This committee was focused on the Russian aggression long before 2016 election. So it is, is disheartening to wonder why more action was not taken sooner. I hope you will add some insight into this important matter. Every day, the American public is bombarded with news about the Russian interference in our elections. Many of these reports are false and or misleading. Today is an opportunity to focus on the truth, and the truth can be only found through a full and fair investigation of all the facts. The committee has a vital duty to the American public to conduct comprehensive bipartisan oversight of the intelligence community and to follow the facts wherever they lead. To that end, your testimony today will greatly help us meet this solemn obligation. And with that, with that, I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Schiff, for five minutes for any opening comments that he would like to make. Adam. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, Director Brennan, and welcome. Uh, we thank you for coming before our committee and for your lifetime of service to the country. We woke today to the terrible news from Manchester that a suicide bomber killed and wounded scores of young people, including children enjoying music at a concert. It's difficult to describe the depravity of that act, let alone view the images of the carnage which has now been claimed by ISIS. We know that your colleagues in the intelligence community are doing everything they can to share information with the British and working day and night to prevent such attacks from again plaguing our own country. We thank them and the brave servicemen and women fighting this scourge of terror in places like Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. Two months ago, our committee held its first open hearing with then FBI Director Comey and NSA Director Rogers. Because Mr. Comey was responsible for investigating whether U.S. persons were involved in the Russia hacking of our election, many of our questions at that hearing went to the issue of collusion. It was at that hearing that Director Comey first revealed that the FBI had opened a foreign counterintelligence investigation of people associated with the Trump campaign in July of last year, and that this investigation was ongoing. Director Comey and Rogers also repudiated the President's contention that he was the subject of an illegal wiretapping operation orchestrated by his predecessor. 
Today we'll hear the testimony of former CIA Director John Brennan, who had the responsibility to determine Russia's plans and intentions in the United States and around the world. Those plans involved an unprecedented attack on our democratic institutions, and those intentions included a desire to tear down our democracy, and more than that, a wish to undermine the candidacy of Hillary Clinton and advance the prospects that Donald Trump would become President of the United States. The audacity of the Russian intervention in our election took most Americans by surprise. And today we will look to Director Brennan to inform us when the CIA first learned that the Russians intended to do more than gather foreign intelligence and were intent on weaponizing the data by publishing it at critical times during the campaign. What accounts for the Russian willingness to interfere in such a brazen way? What were they hoping to accomplish and why were they willing to run the risk of getting caught? Did the Russians believe that the U.S. government response would be so muted that they could get away with it and pay little price? Since the decision to intervene in our election came from the very top levels of the Kremlin, was Putin himself encouraged by then-candidate Trump's call for the Russians to hack Hillary Clinton's emails and his promise that they would be richly rewarded for doing so? While the CIA's mission is to gather foreign intelligence, we will also want to explore with Director Brennan what the agency may have learned about the issue of U.S. person involvement in the Russian operation and can share an open session about how the Russians may have identified or targeted U.S. persons to secure their assistance or co-opt them, and what mechanism was established, if any, for the sharing of information between elements of the intelligence community and the FBI. Our agencies have concluded that the Russian attack on our democracy was not a one-off and they will do so again. In fact, the Russians are already employing many of the same tactics in Europe. We will want to know the director's views of the broader Russian aims and what we can do to stop them. Finally, the disruption of our democracy that the Russians sought to provoke continues to reverberate throughout our government. Over the course of the last two weeks, several matters have been alleged that are of grave concern to our committee and the public that have a direct bearing on our investigation and the relationship between the president and the intelligence community. It is alleged that the president shared sensitive and classified information with the Russians that was provided by one of our intelligence partners. It is alleged that the president urged Director Comey to lay off the investigation of Michael Flynn and ask the director to pledge his loyalty. Most recently, it is alleged that the president weighed in with the directors Rogers and Coates and urged them to rebut the issue of collusion and that his staff asked personnel at those agencies to lobby Director Comey to drop the Flynn case. And significantly, it was admitted by the president himself that the Russia probe was the primary motivation behind his firing of Mr. Comey. If accurate, these events would have taken place shortly after you left the CIA. But as I imagine, you must have maintained many relationships with the incredible workforce at the CIA and elsewhere, where you served for many decades. We will be interested to learn whether members of the intelligence community have shared information with you that corroborates any of these allegations and how you assess the conduct of the administration may be impacting the ability of our agencies to gather critical information from our partners and the ability of the FBI to carry out its investigation free from interference. And last, I want to say a word about the appointment of Mr. Mueller as special counsel. Many of us have known Director Mueller for many years and have the utmost respect for him. But I take sharp issue with those who have suggested that his appointment as important as it was to ensure public confidence in the conduct of the DOJ investigation somehow obviates the need for our own congressional probe. Our investigation and Mr. Mueller's have two very different but equally important objects. His will ultimately determine whether any U.S. laws were broken and who should be brought to justice if they were. And ours will be to determine the whole scope of Russian intervention in which U.S. personal involvement is but one part whether our response was adequate, what steps need to be taken to protect us in the future, and importantly, to make many of our, public, our hearings and findings public, since a well-informed electorate is our only sure defense. I thank the chairman, and I yield back. Chairman yields back. Uh, Mr. Brennan, do you have an opening statement? Uh, yes, sir, I do. You're, you're recognized. Thank you. Representative Conaway, Representative Schiff, and members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. As you know, I served as director of the Central Intelligence Agency from March 2013 to January of this year, as assistant to President Obama for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism from 2009 to 2013, and as a CIA, CIA officer from 1980 to 2005. I am currently serving as a part-time senior advisor at Kissinger Associates.
I would like to express my deepest condolences, like you, to the British people and to the families of those killed and injured in yesterday's heinous attack against innocents in Manchester. I am confident that intelligence, security, and law enforcement officers from the United Kingdom, United States, and other countries are actively working to find those responsible and to prevent further attacks, and I wish them Godspeed. Congress and the American people have already heard from former and current U.S. officials intimately involved in uncovering Russian attempts to interfere in the 2016 presidential election, notably from former Director of National Intelligence James Clapper, former Director of the FBI James Comey, former Acting Attorney General Sally Yates, and NSA Director Admiral Mike Rogers. Rather than repeating details contained in their testimonies, I will use this opportunity to make three main points before I take your questions. First, I'm exceptionally proud of the work done by the women and men of the CIA, who, along with their talented colleagues from the FBI, NSA, and the Office of the DNI, tracked and exposed Russian active measures against our presidential election. When it became clear to me last summer that Russia was engaged in a very aggressive and wide-ranging effort to interfere in one of the key pillars of our democracy, we pulled together experts from CIA, NSA, and FBI in late July to focus on the issue, drawing in multiple perspectives and subject matter experts with broad expertise to assess Russian attempts to interfere in the U.S. presidential election. The purpose was to ensure that experts from key agencies had access to information and intelligence relevant to Russian actions so that we could have as full an appreciation as possible on the scope, nature, and intentions of this Russian activity. The experts provided regular updates and assessments through the summer and fall which we used to inform senior U.S. officials, including President Obama. The work also was leveraged for the intelligence community assessment that was completed in early January under the aegis of the Director of National Intelligence. Second, it should be clear to everyone that Russia brazenly interfered in our 2016 presidential election process and that they undertook these activities despite our strong protests and explicit warning that they not do so. Along these lines, on 4 August of last year, I spoke to Alexander Bortnikov, the head of Russia's Federal Security Bureau, the FSB, Russia's internal security and intelligence service. The bulk of the scheduled call focused on Syria, as Mr. Bortnikov was my principal Russian interlocutor on terrorism matters. In consultation with the White House, I took the opportunity to raise two additional issues with him. I first told Mr. Bortnikov, as I had several times previously, that the continued mistreatment and harassment of U.S. diplomats in Moscow was irresponsible, reckless, intolerable, and needed to stop. Over the years, it has been Mr. Bortnikov's FSB that has been most responsible for this outrageous behavior. I next raised the published media reports of Russian attempts to interfere in our upcoming presidential election. I told Mr. Bortnikov that if Russia had such a campaign underway, it would be certain to backfire. I said that all Americans, regardless of political affiliation or whom they might support in the election, cherish their ability to elect their own leaders without outside interference or disruption. I said American voters would be outraged by any Russian attempt to interfere in the election. Finally, I warned Mr. Bortnikov that if Russia pursued this course, it would destroy any near-term prospect for improvement in relations between Washington and Moscow and would undermine constructive engagement even on matters of mutual interest. As I expected, Mr. Bortnikov denied that Russia was doing anything to influence our presidential election, claiming that Moscow is a traditional target of blame by Washington for such activities. He said that Russia was prepared to work with whichever candidate wins the election. When I repeated my warning, he again denied the charge, but said that he would inform President Putin of my comments. I believe I was the first U.S. official to brace the Russians on this matter. Third, through the so-called Gang of Eight process, we kept Congress apprised of these issues as we identified them. Again, in consultation with the White House, I personally briefed the full details of our understanding of Russian attempts to interfere in the election to congressional leadership, specifically Senators Harry Reid, Mitch McConnell, Dianne Feinstein, and Richard Burr, and to Representatives Paul Ryan, Nancy Pelosi, Devin Nunes, and Adam Schiff between 11 August and 6 September. I provided the same briefing to each of the Gang of Eight members. Given the highly sensitive nature of what was an active counterintelligence case involving an ongoing Russian effort to interfere in our presidential election, the full details of what we knew at the time were shared only with those members of Congress, each of whom was accompanied by one senior staff member. The substance of those briefings was entirely consistent with the main judgments contained in the January classified and unclassified assessments, 
namely that Russia's goals were to undermine public faith in the U.S. democratic process, denigrate Secretary Clinton and harm her electability and potential presidency, and to help President Trump's election chances. Let me conclude by saying that it was a very special privilege to serve as a CIA officer for the first 25 years of my public service. And it was the highest honor of my professional career, and always will be, to have served another four years as director of CIA. CIA officers of all disciplines, past, present, and future, serve this country and their fellow citizens with tremendous dedication, talent, and courage. They recognize that this country's national security rests heavily on their continued outstanding work and on the sacrifices they and their families make every day on behalf of their fellow citizens. We all owe a great debt of gratitude to all CIA officers and their families for what they have done and continue to do to protect this country. And I will now be pleased to take your questions. Well, again, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Brennan, thank you very much for your long service, uh, distinguished, uh, and for agreeing to come this morning. I'm joined on our task force by uh, two able prosecutors who I'd like to yield my five minutes to, uh, to Tom Rainey. Tom? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Director, if you could just take a, a quick minute before I start with my line of questioning with regard to what happened last night in Manchester to do whatever you can, the best you can from your expert uh, uh, expert opinion to try to reassure the American people that what we do in this country and what we're trying to do uh, would help thwart and stop any kind of similar activity here in the in the future. If you could help try to put American minds at ease briefly, I, I would appreciate any words that you might have of advice. Well, I would say that ISIS and Al Qaeda and their terrorist terrorist affiliates continue to try to carry out these outrageous attacks. Uh, in Europe, as well as the United States. But I can say with great confidence that this country has the absolute best counterterrorism community that knits together the experts uh, from intelligence, law enforcement, homeland security, and does a great job of making sure that our federal structure is interoperating as best it can with state and local officials and local law enforcement. And so I have seen a, a, a tremendous, tremendous growth of capability, as well as uh, uh, in, in enhanced national architecture, architecture since 9-11, in terms of the ability to share counterterrorism counter information quickly, terrorist threat information, so that when it's collected overseas or wherever, it gets to those individuals who have to take action on it. So I can uh, assure the American people that I know today my former colleagues are working even harder than they ever had before to prevent attacks. Thank you, sir. And to, to the matter at hand, we heard the ranking member speak uh, in his opening as well as we've heard in, in the press um, numerous times with regard to, and in your opening statement, the Russian investigation, what, what the Russians were trying to do with regard to our election, the Russians uh, interfering with our election, whether it be through the RT or propaganda or whatever, uh, we know that that has now unfortunately become the new norm and something that we're all going to have to deal with. And our charge on this committee isn't so much uh, necessarily to try to seek out and root out criminal behavior, especially now in light of the new uh, special counsel, Robert Mueller, who would be looking into those type of things. But for us on the intelligence committees, whether it be here or in the Senate, to try to improve the intelligence community's ability to do our jobs and to make a report, a recommendation to you and the, the new administration as to how we better uh, defend ourselves against what Russia and or others may be trying to do with regard to affecting our republic and our democracy. And in doing so, if we do find any kind of criminal behavior, I think that the, the minority would agree that those type of, uh, that type of information would be referred to the Justice Department, which is the, the proper jurisdiction. But with regard to the, the, the main question at hand, in your experience with the Russian trying to involve themselves in our election, did you ever find any evidence as the ranking member spoke of collusion while you were the director? Did you find direct evidence of collusion between the Trump campaign and Putin in Moscow while you were there? <clears throat> Mr. Rooney, I I never was an FBI agent, I never was a prosecutor, so I really don't do evidence. I do intelligence throughout the course of my, of my career. As an intelligence professional, uh, what we try to do is to make sure that we provide all relevant information to uh, 
the Bureau if there is an investigation underway that they are looking into criminal activity. As I mentioned in my opening statement, I was convinced uh, in the summer that the Russians were trying to interfere in the election. And they were very aggressive. They had, it was a multifaceted effort. And I wanted to make sure that we were able to expose as much of that as possible. But was there intelligence that said that the Trump campaign was colluding with Moscow during their campaign? There was intelligence that the Russian intelligence services were actively involved in this effort. And having been involved in many counterintelligence cases in the past, I know what the Russians try to do. They try to suborn individuals. And they try to get individuals, including U.S. persons, to act on their behalf, either wittingly or unwittingly. And I was uh, worried by a number of the contacts that the Russians had with U.S. persons. And so therefore, by the time I left office on January 20th, I had unresolved questions in my mind as to whether or not the Russians had been successful in getting U.S. persons involved in the campaign or not to work on their behalf again, either in a witting or unwitting fashion. And so, therefore, I felt as though the FBI investigation was uh, certainly uh, well-founded and needed to look into those issues. When you talk about, uh, and I am running out of time, but hopefully I'll, I'll be able to circle back, can you describe their capabilities beyond just propaganda and actual infiltrating whether or not there was, uh, you had intelligence to infiltrate the campaign with capabilities beyond just propaganda and beyond just reaching out or trying to influence the news or the campaign uh, and, and how long have we known about these type of capabilities? We, there's a lot of intelligence that's been built up over the years about Russia's MO in terms of trying to gain influence in Western democracies. How they've been able to use individuals, they've been able to use politicians, political parties, they've been able to use elements within the media to try to make sure that their objectives are realized. And so, again, knowing what the Russian MO is and has been, including in elections in Europe, I certainly was concerned that they were practicing the same types of activities here in the United States. And that's why, as I said, we set up a group in uh, late July that included the FBI and NSA. I wanted to make sure that every information and bit of intelligence that we had was shared with the Bureau so that they could take it. It was well beyond my mandate as director of CIA to follow on uh, any of those leads uh, that involved U.S. persons. But I made sure that anything that was involving U.S. persons, including anything involving the uh, individuals involved in the Trump campaign, was shared with the Bureau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Time expired. Mr. Schiff, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, wanted to uh, follow up on a, a comment that I made in the opening statement, uh, and that is with respect to a number of the allegations that have been made recently uh, that the president uh, or his aides may have sought to enlist the help of members of the IC or Director Comey himself to drop the Flynn investigation. Uh, have any members of the IC shared with you uh, their concerns that the president was attempting to enlist the help of people within the intelligence community to drop the Flynn investigation? No, sir. Um, are you aware of any uh, efforts the president has made to enlist the support of inter, uh, intelligence community personnel to push back on uh, a narrative involving the collusion issue that Mr. Rooney was asking about? I am unaware of it. Um, I want to ask you about the uh, allegations concerning the president's meetings in the White House uh, in the Oval Office with the Russians. Um, First, uh, what concerns you might have uh, if the allegations are accurate uh, about sharing information that we may have obtained from an intelligence partner, what impact do you think that might have on not only that partner but other intelligence partners' willingness to share intelligence with the United States? Uh, but more than that, if you could also shed your insights on, on one other thing, and that is um, the Russians' reaction to that meeting was, was at least twofold. One was... Vladimir Putin's offer to validate what happened in the Oval Office, uh, to provide his own transcript of that meeting, uh, but also the Russian publication of photographs from that meeting. Uh, the, Ra the Russians had to understand that the publication of those photos uh, would be harmful to the president, uh, or the president would have invited American press into that meeting. Uh, what do you think motivated the Russians to publish those photos? Uh, what do you think motivated Putin to make a claim he knew would never be accepted to provide their own transcript of that meeting. Uh, is this just further efforts to uh, weaken the president, disrupt our political process? Uh, 
how do you explain those events? <laughs> a lot of questions there, Mr. Schiff. Uh, the first point I'd like to make is that I shared classified information with the Russians while I was director of CIA. CIA, on a routine basis, shares classified information with Russians on terrorism matters. It doesn't mean that it becomes unclassified. It means that it retains the classification, but is releasable then to Russia or to other partners. So that in itself is not unprecedented. And I don't know what was shared or said in the Oval Office, but um, if the reports in the press are true that Mr. Trump decided to spontaneously share some intelligence with the Russians, I think he would have basically violated two protocols. Uh, and those two protocols are, one is that such intelligence, classified intelligence, is not shared with visiting foreign ministers or local ambassadors. It's shared through intelligence channels because it needs to be handled the right way, and it needs to make sure that it is not exposed. He didn't do that, if, again, if the press charges are accurate. Secondly, um, before sharing any classified intelligence with foreign partners, it needs to go back to the originating agency to make sure that the language in it is not even just providing the substance going to reveal sources and methods and compromise the future collection capability. So it appears as though, at least from the press reports, that neither uh, did it go in the proper channels, nor did the originating agency have the opportunity to clear language for it. Uh, so that is a problem. What I would be very concerned about, though, is the subsequent releases of class, what appears to be classified information purporting to point to the originator of the information, liaison partners. These continue to be very, very damaging leaks, and I find them appalling, and they need to be tracked down. So uh, that was where the damage came from, I think, uh, that it was released in the press. Now, the Russians are watching very carefully what's going on in Washington right now, and they will try to exploit it for their own purposes and to see whether or not they can further, um, I think, uh, seed partisan uh, animosity here in Washington and try to roil the waters, the political waters here. And so even though uh, the election is over, I think uh, Mr. Putin and Russian intelligence services are trying to actively exploit uh, what is going on now in Washington uh, to their benefit and to our detriment. Uh, Falpa, again, on Mr. Rooney's questions, um, when you uh, had these concerns raised about the Russian efforts and their potential um, uh, effort to suborn U.S. persons to their cause in the hacking operation, did you take steps to set up an organizational structure uh, to analyze the Russian uh, campaign uh, so that a members of the, F the FBI, CIA, NSA, and other agencies um, would look at these uh, allegations in a cohesive fashion? It, yes, and I also recognize that this was an exceptionally, exceptionally sensitive issue, an active counterintelligence case. Uh, trying to stop and uncover what the Russian intelligence activities were in the midst of a hotly debated presidential campaign. Uh, that included information that may have involved U.S. persons' contacts with Russia, whether they be benign or not. And so therefore, one of the key pieces of any type of counterintelligence effort is to compartment that effort so that your operators, your investigators, your collectors can continue to uncover what the Russians were doing. We set up a group within CIA. I spoke to Jim Comey. I spoke to Mike Rogers to make sure that they were able to send over their experts so that they could share information among them, even the most sensitive information that was not disseminated within the community. I wanted to make sure that learning the lessons of 9-11, that there were not going to be any stovepipes and, and barriers to sharing information from the intelligence and law enforcement uh, communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Jim, it's time expired. Uh, Mr. Gowdy, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director, thank you for your service to our country. Let's go back to where we were a couple of minutes ago. You mentioned or you testified that you had a conversation in August of 2016 with your Russian counterpart. You testified that you briefed uh, at least eight members of Congress throughout uh, the pendency of your investigation. When you learned of Russian efforts, and we'll get to that in a minute because I, my understanding from your unclassed report is Russia has historically attempted to interfere with our electoral process, and um, they did so without coordination, collusion, or conspiring with any of the candidates. So they have a history of doing it. We'll, we'll lay that aside for a minute. 2016 electoral process. When you learned of Russian efforts... Did you have evidence of a connection between the Trump campaign and Russian state actors? As I said, Mr. Gowdy, I don't do evidence. Uh, well, I, and we were uncovering information and intelligence about 
interactions and contacts between U.S. persons and the Russians. And as we came upon that, we would share it with the Bureau. I appreciate that you don't do evidence, Director Brennan. Um, unfortunately, that's what I do. That's the word we use. You use the word assessment. You use the word tradecraft. I use the word evidence. Um, and the good news for me is lots of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle use the word evidence, too. Um, one of my colleagues said there is more than circumstantial evidence of collusion between the Russians and the Trump campaign. Now, uh, there are only two types of evidence. There's circumstantial and direct. So if it's more than circumstantial, by necessity, it has to be direct. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of one of my colleagues on the other side of this very committee. Another Democrat colleague on the other side of this committee also used the word evidence, that he has seen evidence of collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russians. And yet a third California Democrat said she had seen no evidence of collusion. So that's three different members of Congress from the same state using the same word, which is evidence. And that's the word that my fellow citizens understand, evidence. Assessment is, is your vernacular. Tradecraft is your vernacular. You and I both know what the word evidence means. And we're not getting into whether or not you corroborated, contradicted, examined, cross-examined. We're not getting into how you tested and probed the reliability of that evidence. It's a really simple question. Did evidence exist of collusion, coordination, conspiracy between the Trump campaign and Russian state actors at the time you learned of 2016 efforts? I encountered and am aware of information and intelligence that um, revealed contacts and interactions between Russian officials and U.S. persons involved in the a Trump campaign that um, I was concerned about because of known Russian efforts to suborn the, such individuals. And it uh, raised questions in my mind, again, whether or not the Russians were able to gain the cooperation of those individuals. I don't know whether or not such collusion, and that's your term, such collusion existed. I don't know. But I know that there was a sufficient basis of information and intelligence that required further uh, investigation by the Bureau to determine whether or not U.S. persons were actively conspiring, colluding with Russian officials. Do you know the basis of that information that you share with the Bureau? I mean, what, what was the nature of the evidence? I, I think, Mr. Gowdy, this committee has now been provided information that relates to that issue in terms of information that the agency shared with the Bureau. And uh, that is something that is appropriately classified. All right. And you learned that when? When, when in this chronology did you learn of the contacts between uh, are these uh, official members of the Trump campaign? Or because there, there's kind of a tripartite hierarchy. There's Trump himself, there are official members of the campaign, and then there are folks who represented themselves as being connected with him. I'm not going to try to identify uh, individuals nor try to parse it. Uh, I don't want you to parse it. I just want summer, you to identify the individuals. I don't want you I'm to parse it. I'm not going to identify the individuals because this is information that, again, is based on uh, classified uh, sources and intelligence. W were they and official this members of the campaign? I I'm going to defer to current agency officials to be able to further uh, provide to you uh, information related to that. But my understanding is that this committee has access to the documents that uh, we would have provided to the Bureau. All right. Um, last question, because I'm out of time. Uh, we can use the word evidence. We both know what the other one's talking about. How did you test, probe, examine, cross-examine, otherwise test the reliability or believability, credibility of that evidence you uncovered? I made sure that the components within CIA that have responsible for counterintelligence, cyber and Russia were uh, actively working to understand as much as possible about the reliability, accuracy of the information that they already collected and the information that was available that needed further uh, corroboration. We'll come back to the next round. Chairman, Mr. Hines, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, thank you, Director Brennan, for being here. Um, it's good to see you again. Um, I want to use my five minutes to try to paint a, a more specific picture around the methods and mechanisms 
uh, that the Russians use to suborn, which is the word that you use and that we've used here today, uh, our, our democracy and our electoral process. And I, I want to start with a quote by a, a, a report. I know you're familiar with CSIS's report, the Kremlin Playbook, in which they say that Russia, quote, seeks to corrode democracy from within by deepening political divides, unquote. The Russians stir the pot, heighten anxieties, and know that when they trigger chaos, even if it ends up negatively affecting them, that they are serving the purpose of weakening us. Um, I want to talk about people, uh, because you made reference to people, and I don't want to do it specifically. Uh, I want to do it in the abstract. Um, the Kremlin playbook that I just referred to says further that Russia looks to corrode democracy by, quote, investing in rising politicians, cultivating relationships with prominent businessmen, or helping to ensure that its business affiliates become well-positioned in government. Mr. Brennan, assuming that you agree with that, how specifically has the Kremlin gone about cultivating relationships with key Americans in an effort to, to, to influence our policy? It is traditional intelligence collection tradecraft in terms of human, which is to identify individuals that you think are either very influential or rising stars, and uh, you will try to develop a relationship with them. And the Russians uh, frequently will do that through cutouts or through false flag operations. They won't identify themselves as Russians or as members of the Russian government. Uh, they will try to develop that personal relationship. And then over time, they will try to get individuals to do things on their behalf. And that's why, again, having been involved in a lot of counterintelligence cases over the years and seeing this pattern over and over again, uh, my radar goes up when I see that the Russians are actively involved in a particular intelligence operation or campaign and that U.S. persons are uh, being contacted by uh, Russian officials. So is it, is it fair to assume you, the phrase you used previously was that you were worried by contacts, that there might have been efforts to suborn. Is it fair to say that those contacts that worried you might, might have been consistent with that age-old Russian recruitment methodology? Sure, and these are contacts that might have been totally, totally innocent and benign, as well as those that might uh, have succumbed somehow to those Russian uh, efforts. Great. Let me let me shift focus from Americans to, to Russians. We, we hear a lot about Russian oligarchs. And I'm not asking you a question about specific Russian oligarchs. We may do that in, in closed session. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about uh, what the role of Russian oligarchs is in Putin's plan? What levers of influence do they use? Uh, and, and, and why do some Americans fall for contacts with Russian oligarchs and business people? Well, Mr. Putin's uh, political standing in Russia is uh, certainly well supported by key oligarchs who control uh, billion-dollar uh, industries and, and parts of the Russian economy, and he is, uh, I think, reliant on them uh, for support, and they are reliant on him for support. And so they obviously have a lot of international connections, a lot of business connections that uh, they will use uh, to advance their business interests. Uh, but also we see that uh, Russian intelligence agencies uh, do not hesitate at all to use uh, private companies and uh, Russian uh, persons who are unaffiliated with the Russian government uh, to uh, support their objectives. And so we've talked about Americans and Russians now uh, in these couple of minutes. Do Americans who are uh, suborned in such a way and Russian oligarchs um, that are recruited or suborned, um, do they necessarily need to know that they are doing Russia's bidding? No, many times they do not. They do not even know that the person that they're acting, uh, interacting with is uh, a Russian. Many times they, they know that individuals may be Russian officials, but they don't know that there's an intelligence connection or an intelligence motive uh, behind it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm running low on time, so um, I'll just close with this thought. Um, there's hardly anyone left today who doubts that Russia attacked us. Um, but what we have to realize is that the true thrust of the Russian attack is what they have triggered in us, the, the partisanship. Uh, every time we refuse to face facts, every time we attack the messenger rather than confront the actions that happen, uh, every time we undercut our allies and our alliances and our values, I think we're playing precisely into Russia's fondest hopes. Uh, we're doing something that, in my opinion, uh, the great cold warriors, uh, be it Ronald Reagan or Harry Truman, would never have allowed. So I, th I thank you uh, for your testimony. I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman, time has expired. Mr. King, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Brennan, before I yield to Mr. Gowdy, I have one question to ask you. Uh, and 
I realize we're in an open session, so I'm going to word it a certain way, but I think you'll understand what I'm saying. In the preparation of the report on the 2016 election, which concluded that Russia favored the election of Donald Trump, who would have made the decision to include or exclude any evidence or indications of Russian intentions that were contrary to that conclusion? <clears throat> Myself, Jim Comey, Mike Rogers, and Jim Clapper relied on the experts who pulled this uh, draft together in the intelligence community assessment. And it was a process where the representatives from those entities uh, wrestled with the language to make sure that they had as much uh, accuracy and precision and consensus as possible. So any adjustments that were made were made during the process. Uh, I met with some of our, my officers who were involved in it. I asked them questions. I wanted to make sure that uh, they were comfortable with sort of the language that was being used. But it would have been that internal interagency process that then resulted in the intelligence community assessment. That is the traditional way that these assessments are uh, drafted, are coordinated, and are published. And again, without even getting to the final conclusion, if there were other evidence, though, that indicated contrary, should that have been listed or not? You're dealing with a lot of information when you put together an intelligence assessment, and it comes down to a distillation process. And uh, as you know, there were two products that were produced, a unclassified version and a highly classified version. And the attempt was to try to include in that highly classified version all of the relevant and pertinent information that needed to be in there in order to undergird the judgments contained. And so uh, was 100% of all of the information of the available put into that highly classified one? No, but it was taken into account. And so therefore, again, some decisions have been to be made about it. But I am unaware that anything was intentionally excluded because of uh, intelligence, that is, uh, that was, uh, for some reason, uh, one of the agencies didn't want in there for uh, a, uh, a reason that was not a very legitimate intelligence reason. If we can discuss that in the ex uh, executive session. Mr. Gowdy, I yield balance my time to you. Thank you, my friend from uh, New York. Uh, Director Brennan, uh, last time we were talking about at the inception of your investigation in 2016, I want uh, the next question to include the inception, the pendency, up until your very last day at the CIA. Did you see evidence of collusion, coordination, conspiracy between Donald Trump and Russian state actors? I saw information and intelligence that was worthy of investigation by the Bureau to determine whether or not such cooperation or conclusion uh, was taking place. That doesn't help us a lot. What was the nature of the information? As I said, Mr. Gowdy, I think this committee now has access to the type of information that I'm alluding to here. It's classified, and uh, um, I'm happy to talk about it in a classified session. And that would have been directly between the candidate and Russian state actors? And that's not what I said. I'm not going to talk but, about any but individuals. That was my but that was my question, and, and, and you answered it. You didn't answer it that way. Uh, no, I, yeah, I responded to your query. Uh, I'm not going to respond to particular elements of your question because I think it would be inappropriate for me to do so here. So, so I can only repeat what I said, which is that I was aware of intelligence and information uh, about contacts uh, between Russian officials and U.S. persons that raised concerns in my mind about whether or not those individuals were cooperating with the Russians either in a witting or unwitting fashion, and that served as the basis for the FBI investigation to determine whether such collusion uh, cooperation uh, occurred. All right. Well, there, there are a bunch of words that start with C floating around. I ask you about collusion, coordination, and conspiracy, and you use the word contact. And, and I, I think in a previous answer, you did a really good job of, of establishing that contact could be uh, benign or not benign. So was it contact that you saw? Was it something more than contact? What is the nature of what you saw? I saw interaction and aware of interaction that, again, raised questions in my mind about what was the true nature of it. But I don't know. I, ha I don't have sufficient information to make a determination whether or not such cooperation or complicity or collusion was taking place. But I know that there was a basis f to have individuals pull those threads. Oh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you saw something that led you to refer it to law enforcement. And in your judgment, it is up to law enforcement 
to test, probe, corroborate, contradict, otherwise investigate uh, the full nature of that information you passed on. Is that a fair way to put it? Yes, it is, because it's not CIA's job to make a determination about whether a U.S. person is cooperating, colluding, or whatever in some type of criminal or illegal matter. It is our responsibility to give the Bureau everything that they need in order to follow that path and make such a determination and recommendation if they want to press charges. All right. We'll pick it up next time. Uh, Ms. Sewell, five minutes. Welcome, Director Brennan. Uh, building on the questions that my colleague, Mr. Himes, uh, uh, talk with you about. I'd like to ask you some more specifics about Russia attacking us and how their attacks specifically cause us to doubt our own credibility as Americans. I'd like to talk about truth and what it means to be truthful to your country if you are in a position of power. Director Brennan, was Putin first within Russia and then against us work, working to undermine truth and how exactly has he done that? Mr. Putin and uh, Russian intelligence services um, are determined to do what they can to influence in a very inappropriate and illegal way activities within Western democracies to undermine the Western-led liberal democratic order. Uh, they do that on a regular basis. They see that as uh, Western democracies as a threat to them. Uh, and uh, so that's why the cyber domain right now is a growing playground for Russian activities. And they will use that and exploit it whatever way they can. So they've been involved in elections for many years, including try to influence the ones here in the United States with propaganda or whatever. But this cyber environment now provides new opportunities to collect, to collect and release, to influence, uh, and they are uh, increasingly adept at it. So you said that um, they're going to do it again. We, the, the IC unclassified assessment said that. Um, and uh, has there been any blowback or consequences to Russia uh, for their interference in our election? And most importantly, what would you do to try to prevent that from happening in future elections? Well, first of all, I think exposure is very, very important to make sure that we're able to confront the Russians and make sure that uh, partners and allies in other countries around the globe are aware of this type of Russian capability. Uh, and it also is important, I think, to have the Russians incur costs, uh, not just in terms of reputational damage, but also uh, actions that I think this government and other governments should take against the Russians when they're caught in those types of activities. Uh, it is anathema to uh, our democratic uh, values, and it's something that I think we need to be able to, again, push back hard against. Have you seen the Trump administration uh, do anything um, to push back, as you said? Um, have you seen or witnessed? I know that you're no longer in the bureau, you know, uh, no longer a director, but um, have you seen any indication that we're trying to uh, punish or stop the Russians from doing this again? I'm not in a position to evaluate uh, because there could be things going on behind the scenes. Uh, we were doing things behind the scenes to, to try to counter Russian activities. We took actions in January in the last days of the administration in terms of uh, PNGing a number of Russian officials here and, and trying to uh, clamp down on their intelligence activities. Uh, maybe the, the current administration is doing the same thing. I don't know. So, Director Brennan, um, can you talk about more about Russia's uh, disinformation campaign and what tools the Russians use to do that? They use all sorts of tools. As I said, they have been able to uh, control uh, various media outlets. Uh, obviously, they use RT. Uh, TV here in the United States, which has a you know a fairly significant audience, uh, they use individuals who have um, who are writers or publishers, uh, editorialists. Uh, again, some of this is is very um, obvious to those who are involved because they're on the the payrolls. I'm talking globally now. Uh, they're on the payrolls of Russian intelligence, and so they place uh, pieces uh, that advance Russia's interests. So uh, I, I just wanted to really kind of go back to what I was trying to say before, which is about 
truth, getting to the truth. And I can't emphasize enough how damaging this disinformation campaign is. And it troubles me so much that there are those in this country that um, who are practicing similar tactics, I think, attacking truth, calling disagreeable facts fake news, and attacking the messenger rather than confronting the message um, that the Russians are trying to get us uh, to believe. Uh, it's divert, it's dissemble, it's deny. And these are Putin's tactics that are that we're seeing and embracing in America. In other words, truth is being replaced by trust. People trust this person or this news source, even if it isn't objectively true. So we can't all agree on a common set of facts. And that's a big problem, I believe, um, that really is leading to the divide that we see in this country. Our national security has never been uh, as partisan as it is now. And I think that... Um, the the truth is that they interfered in our elections, and the truth is the American people want to get to the bottom of it, and the truth is we, uh, as um, elected officials and on this committee, should be doing all we can to make sure that we find out how they did it, we make sure we know um, who helped them do it, and that we also get to the bottom of um, making sure that it doesn't happen again. So my last question to you is, um, do you believe that um, one of the things you talked about was exploit? You said that, um, that even though the election is over, Putin is still, and Russians are still exploiting us. What did you mean by that? I mean that, uh, again, this has been a pattern of Russian intelligence services to try to take advantage of the openness of Western societies, uh, free press and other things, and political parties and systems to find um, opportunities and vulnerabilities that they can use to advance their interests. They will continue to do this. I think they're probably taking some lessons from this past experience. Uh, I don't believe that this is going to make them at all recoil and not engage in these types of things in the past. I think that the, what they will do is to further refine their tactics so that they can be as successful as possible in the future. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lobiondo, five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Brennan, uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you for your service. And I have a number of questions I know in an open setting uh, you won't be able to answer, so I'm looking forward to the closed setting. But um, Ms. Sewell uh, asked to the extent you can answer in this setting what the elements of Russian active measures in the campaign of the election were. So are these... Uh, you, can you be any more specific than your answer with her about what they were doing, what you saw? I think they're all chronicled in the Unclassified Intelligence Community Assessment in terms of it's very clear that the GRU was responsible for hacking into the, the, the networks of the, the DNC, DCCC, and uh, were responsible through a cutout, releasing it through places like Lucifer 2.0, uh, WikiLeaks, and, and others. Uh, and so they were uh, taking advantage of information that they had collected that uh, they determined if it was publicly released was going to advance their objectives that I had enumerated before. In addition, they uh, amplified a lot of fake news stories uh, that tried to denigrate uh, Secretary Clinton. Um, so it was a, a mixture of propaganda. It was uh, cyber collection. And it was the release of information uh, that uh, was, uh, again, seen as damaging to, uh, to one of the candidates that uh, they were trying to, uh, to harm. So you said a moment ago that you don't believe they'll be deterred from engaging in activity like this in the future. Do you, do you think they would attempt to influence the 2018 midterm elections? I... I I have, unfortunately, grudging respect for Russian intelligence capabilities and uh, their um, aggressiveness, their pervasiveness, and their determination to do what they can to undermine uh, this country's democracy and democratic uh, institutions, uh, as well as those uh, certainly in Europe and other areas. So I believe that they will try to exploit elections, but they don't, will not wait on, only until elections. We know that they, again, are aggressively collecting and trying to evaluate individuals uh, who may be influential, who currently are in government or are not. Uh, the Russian intelligence threat is a serious one, and uh, this is just one manifestation of the nature of that threat. Uh, during your tenure as CIA director, did you have the resources and authorities necessary to uh, conduct what you needed to with, as it pertained to the Russians? Uh, I, I had 
um, resources and authorities that allowed us to do things. Uh, but I think this is something that maybe in a classified setting we can talk more about. And um, if we need to go to classified setting, I understand. But were there additional suggestions that you would give to this intelligence committee of what we should be doing proactively to enable um, not just the CIA but the FBI and the NSA for um, to to thwart the future meddling? Sure. Okay. Um, based on what happened here, uh, do you think there are ways that we can assist our allies in thwarting what the Russians are doing? Uh, is it simply sharing information or are there additional measures that can be taken? Because I think if one of us is successful, then more of us can be successful. I think it's a combination of things, and I have to be careful here, again, in an open setting, but uh, certainly sharing information uh, and making sure that they're aware of the techniques, the tactics, the procedures, uh, as well as the practitioners that the Russians use. Uh, that is something that's very important. Uh, we also uh, need to be able to uh, work some uh, joint operations together so that we can expose Russian actors in a variety of places. And uh, I know that my former colleagues who currently are still in the intelligence community are working very closely with a lot of sister services to do exactly that and to catch the, the Russians uh, in their efforts uh, to undermine uh, democratic institutions. We need to continue to do that. We need to continue to do even more of it. I'm not sure if you can answer in this setting, but while we're focusing on Russia, do you have indications that there was any collusion with the Russians, with other state actors, the Iranians, the North Koreans, um, to meddle against us? Uh, I, I do not believe that uh, they were uh, partnered with other countries in this most recent effort to undermine last year's election. Do you believe that other countries were involved in attempting to influence us? Um, I'd have to think about that, and I want to talk to you about that in closed session. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman's uh, time expired. Uh, Mr. Carson, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Director, for your service to our country. Uh, we've talked about Putin's desire to weaken our democracy from the inside out. And I want to turn to how our democracy has been undermined by attacks on our military, uh, diplomatic, and intelligence professionals. In our 240 years, uh, America has spent a lot of blood and treasure to make the world safe for democracy. We work to ensure this at home, and we work to ensure it abroad. Our diplomatic intelligence and military professionals have been at the forefront of that effort. Uh, they're the reason we've succeeded. They've worked tirelessly to promote democratic values because we value democracy in itself, but also because it helps us to prevent war. Now, those professionals have helped advance the cause of freedom, and they've helped enable economic opportunities. Director Brennan, in your mind, does Putin want us to be successful? And secondly, does he want to see democracy thrive around the world? I would imagine he doesn't. No and no. <laughs> Director Brennan, uh, how do our intelligence professionals in particular support America's mission to protect the world from war and to maintain global stability? We are this nation's um, forward deployed radar. We are the ones that need to make sure that we understand what is going on, but also what is uh, underway uh, in the future. We need to uh, make sure that we're able to assess uh, capabilities and intentions of foreign actors if they try to do us harm, uh, as well as to support our diplomatic efforts, our war fighters, uh, our homeland security specialists, and others. Uh, the foreign intelligence uh, uh, IC community has a, a, an enormous task to uh, cover the globe, do it 24-7, uh, frequently in places where they are in harm's way, but also in other areas where the threat to U.S. national security is much less obvious, much more insidious, and sometimes much more threatening. And so, therefore, our, our nation's uh, intelligence professionals really um, have a lot on their shoulders as far as keeping this country safe and secure. Yes, sir. And lastly, Director Brennan, do you believe, sir, that uh, Putin and the Kremlin would like to see us hamper and shrink our intelligence and diplomatic capabilities? 
Sure, they know that we, we, we are their principal nemesis. We are the reasons why they have not been successful in so many areas, and we've been able to undercut and undermine them. So although they are capable, uh, I wouldn't uh, suggest for one moment that uh, the U.S. intelligence community has not been uh, very successful in uh, preventing and thwarting uh, Russia. It's so important, sir. You know, Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, I think he knows that diplomats are the tip of the spear. Uh, he said himself in 2013, and I quote, if you don't fully fund the State Department, then I need to buy more ammunition, end quote. So I'm concerned, as we all are, sir, when we see proposed cuts of a third to the State Department, a third to the entire budget, their entire budget, and the announcement that we, the United States of America, no longer champion human rights around the world. We are concerned uh, with efforts to undercut our intelligence professionals, comparing them at times to Nazis, comments by our own leaders. We can't let Vladimir Putin continue to undermine us by doing exactly what he wants us to do. Generations of intelligence, diplomatic, and military professionals have fought for our independence and for the march of democracy around the world. And I don't think, sir, neither do the rest of us, that we can we can't let their important work prove to be nothing. I thank you for your commitment and service to our great nation. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Jim yields back. I inadvertently skipped Mr. Rooney for his own five minutes, so Mr. Rooney, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Director, I, I want to say that uh, I have been up to the agency to review those documents that you had referred to before, and I look forward to talking about uh, the information therein in our closed session. I also want to mention something that we had talked with uh, Admiral Rogers and Mr. Comey for in our last or two open sessions ago from the Intelligence House Intelligence Committee. It's one that sort of got a lot of hoopla on TV with regard to uh, our side of the aisle here trying to make uh, a diversionary tactic when we talk about the importance uh, of what leaks do with our intelligence community. And I just want to ask you uh, if you agree with Admiral Rogers that um, when high-level intelligence community officials, I, I think uh, some news reports had uh, almost 20 people leaking classified information to the press, if you agree with Admiral Rogers that that kind of leaking um, with, our, with our ability to have to reauthorize things like 702 so we can gather intelligence on bad guys um, for political purposes, if you agree that that kind of uh, activity actually hurts our national security. I think the unauthorized disclosure of classified information at all times hurts our national security, compromises our intelligence uh, capabilities, uh, and needs to uh, be investigated, needs to, to stop, absolutely. Thank, thank you. W with regard to more specific questions, with regard to uh, hacking, when did you learn of the Russian hacking in the last election cycle? In the, Roughly. Uh, in the summer. Uh, and did you at that time notify the both campaigns that you uh, or did somebody at the agency or, or are you aware that both campaigns were notified at that time that there was an effort by the Russians to hack and try to influence the, uh, the political campaign of, uh, of last year? I was aware that both campaigns were being contacted and notified about it, yes. Um, you said, to, I, I believe, to Mr. Gowdy that you, you believe that there was information of contact between people in the Trump universe and Moscow, whether or not that was collusion or not remains to be seen. You said you didn't know if it was actual collusion. I think that your words were, I don't know. Um, can you tell us whether or not, from the information that you've looked at, it looks like the intelligence shows that Moscow was actually rooting for Donald Trump, or were they rooting against Hillary Clinton, and why? I think my assessment is it was both. Um, I, I think that they, th at different times in the campaign, they felt that the fortunes of one candidate or the other was going up or down. Um, and I think that they, uh, most of the time, believed that Secretary Clinton was going to win the election. And so their efforts to denigrate her were not just to try to diminish her chances of winning, but also to uh, hurt her um, and s for her eventual presidency. Uh, but also, uh, it's my assessment that uh, they clearly had uh, a more favorable view toward Mr. Trump and actions they were taking were trying to increase his prospects even though I think that they probably felt as though they were um, not all that great. Why? 
Why did they? Why did they want her? And, or why did they want him and not her? Uh, I think that's a variety of reasons. One is that there was a have been a traditional, I think, animus certainly between Mr. Putin and, and Secretary Clinton, uh, as well as uh, uh, th there has not been a good relationship between the Putins and the, between Putin and the Clintons over the years. I uh, felt that uh, Secretary Clinton, with some of her actions while she was Secretary of State, uh, led to some of the domestic disturbances inside of Russia. And I think he was more concerned that she was going to be more rigid on certain issues, particularly on human rights and other issues. But what was, what was Donald Trump going to do for them then? Or was it just that they didn't like Hillary? No, I think they, uh, they felt that's, that uh, Mr. Trump, being a, a, a bit of an outsider, uh, and that they have in the past had had some good relations with businessmen who happened to elevate into positions of of government authority, and so felt as though from a negotiating standpoint that he might so, be more amenable so to good some. relations. Uh, uh, what if that's true? One of the questions that I have, and this might be more appropriate for closed session, but if that's true, um, was there in your in your uh, review of the evidence, was there more damaging evidence of Secretary Clinton that was not revealed? And if it wasn't revealed, what does that say about their, the Russian ability to be actually rooting for her to win? Well, uh, yeah, we can talk about it in close, but as I said, I think that they anticipated that Secretary Clinton was going to win the election. And so they, I believe that they tried to damage and bloody her before the election. Uh, but also, uh, I would have uh, anticipated that had she been elected, that their efforts to denigrate her and hurt her would have continued during her presidency. So if they did collect more information about her that they did not release, I think they were probably husbanding it for a, another day. Thank you. Chairman Yost, back. Uh, Ms. Spear, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director Brennan, for your service. Um, I'd like to spend some time talking about the outsized role that the Ro Russian oligarchy um, plays in terms of um, supporting the Russian government. It's been said that um, there are, when the Russians want to cultivate a U.S. person, um, they will do it over a long period of time. Is that your experience? I, yeah, I guess a lot depends on the U.S. person and their willingness to uh, work with the Russians. Were you aware that they were attempting to cultivate then real estate developer Donald Trump for almost eight years? I'm not going to talk about any individuals. And, no. um, are Russian oligarchs encouraged to invest in the United States? By whom? By Putin. Uh, there are some tremendous uh, investment opportunities here in the United States, and uh, certainly I think that uh, Mr. Putin would like to see more Russian involvement and investment here in the United States, so yes. And with that Russian investment, is there an expectation that they're going to provide information to President Putin about what's going on in the United States? I would fully anticipate that uh, some of the key Russian oligarchs and their business interests are you know, tapped on a regular basis by Russian intelligence for information, yes. So were any of the oligarchs investing in U.S. properties owned by then real estate developer Trump? I don't know the answer to that question. Are you aware that in 2015 alone there were 106 visas granted to Russians for investing in the United States in amounts of money of $500,000 or more. They're called EB-5 visas. Uh, I'm unaware of that. So as a general rule within the CIA, you did not investigate those who were granted EB-5 visas? Uh, it may have come across our screen. We may have intelligence on it. I'm just not personally aware of uh, a lot of the information that the CIA had collected. So in 2014, the United States, the European Union, and Canada imposed sanctions on Russia in response to their invasion of Ukraine and um, Crimea. These sanctions greatly restricted the flow of private money to the Russian government and business leaders. How much pain do you think those sanctions have caused Russia? Uh, I think it has been increasingly painful, and I believe that one of Mr. Putin's priorities has been, um, especially over the last year, to try to get those sanctions reduced, and his strategy is uh, getting European countries to separate from the U.S.-led sanction effort. And 
That's why I think as part of this effort, they were trying to drive a wedge between Europe and, and Washington. And uh, some of the unfavorable characterizations of Secretary Clinton indicated that she was uh, an unreliable leader and that there were going to be problems for Europe. So I think that's part of a, a broader Russian strategy. Again, I think that he, Mr. Putin wants sanctions removed sooner rather than later. So that's, you would say that's one of his top, if not very top, policy objectives in dealing with the United States. It's certainly, it's a, it's a key one, but it's, it's more dealing with us indirectly by trying to, to uh, wean the, uh, the European nations off of the, of the sanctions uh, wagon. So I- Igor Rosneft, uh, Igor Sechin, who was the CEO of Rosneft, and then Rex Tillerson, the CEO of ExxonMobil, um, were doing a deal in Russia that was about a billion dollars, I believe. The sanctions that were imposed in 2014 shut that down. Is that correct? I I believe so. I'm not sure. So, again, it it would make the case that the impacts on Russia are grave in terms of the sanctions. Let me ask you another question. There have been reports in in newspapers that um, British and Dutch intelligence had provided information about meetings in European cities between Russian officials associated with uh, President Putin and associates of the Trump campaign. Is that how you first found out about those meetings? I am not going to talk about uh, anything that uh, any of our international partners might have shared with us. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chairman Lady yields back. Uh, Ms. Ross Layton, five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Brennan, for being here. Because of your long history with the, with the agency, I think that you're the, the perfect uh, uh, expert to give us some historical perspective on how long uh, Russia has been at this, this active measure uh, campaign. How long would you say that Russia and the Soviet Union uh, sought to undermine the, the process of our, our democratic uh, framework here in the West? For many, many decades. For decades. And did Russia attempt to collect intelligence on specific U.S. presidential candidates or uh, target political parties or organizations in the U.S. before 2016, or was it more of a a general uh, campaign? Yeah, well, I would defer to the Bureau, um, which would have the investigative lead in terms of what might be happening here on U.S. soil. But uh, I know uh, that, uh, again, the Russians try to uh, cultivate relationships with with individuals. But, uh, again, I would defer to the Bureau. Thank you. Um, Can you provide any examples of past Russian or Soviet uh, active measures, as they're called? Well, it it runs the gamut from uh, targeted assassinations of dissidents, of members of the media, of... uh, inside of Russia as well as outside of Russia, uh, to uh, getting people uh, on their payroll in uh, foreign governments and to carry out their, their actions, uh, to um, the, their efforts in Ukraine uh, as not just the military takeover of Crimea, but their uh, basic intervention into eastern Ukraine uh, with their intelligence and paramilitary services. Uh, to the active propagation of propaganda and disinformation uh, as they try to besmirch and tarnish uh, individuals, as well as the use of of blackmail, compromat, uh, that they would be able to then leverage uh, for their own purposes. So it it really does uh, run the gamut uh, from the the most heinous and and violent uh, to that which is much more subtle and insidious. Yes, the, the scope is, is alarming. Uh, how does uh, the Kremlin's attempt to influence the, this previous election compare to Soviet active measures uh, during the Cold War? What has changed in their stagecraft? Well, I think when we talk about U.S. presidential elections, and we know that the Russians were trying to influence outcomes uh, as well as perceptions, uh, uh, 
back to the 1960s, I believe. Um, but again, the, the cyber environment now really provides so much more opportunity for a variety of troublemaking, uh, and the Russians take advantage of it. So the ability to go in and to collect uh, and to use different types of techniques, spear phishing, whatever else, so that they can then gain access to people's emails, computer systems, and networks. Uh, it is uh, something that the Russians are quite adept at. And what we've seen recently is uh, the collaboration between Russian intelligence services and organized criminals. I think it was in March that the Department of Justice uh, indicted four individuals, two members of the FSB and two well-known uh, organized criminals, hackers, uh, because of the, uh, the pillaging of the Yahoo uh, servers. Uh, and that collaboration between Russian intelligence and Russian organized crime, I think, is more and more of a concern so that they can promote the, uh, their respective interests. Uh, so this is something that I think the Russians are looking for new opportunities to partner with whomever they can in order to do what they, they want to do. And as a, a young analyst, you probably had a lot of dealings with uh, Andropov, the head of the KGB in the early 80s, and he was very focused on, on this active measure campaign. Well, yes, I, as a young analyst, I wouldn't have had direct interaction with Andropov, but I have studied uh, Russian uh, intelligence activities over the years and have seen it, um, again, manifest in many different of our counterintelligence cases and, and how they have been able to get people, including inside of CIA, to become treasonous, uh, and frequently individuals who go along that treasonous path do not even realize they're along that path until it gets to be a bit too late. And that's why, again, my, my radar goes up early when I see certain things that I know what the Russians are trying to do, and I don't know whether or not uh, the targets of their efforts uh, are as uh, mindful of the, the Russian intentions as they need to be. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Lady, back. Uh, Mr. Quigley, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director, for your service. So you said you became aware of U.S. persons' interactions with the Russians, and you've mentioned your radar going up. Is a part of that who the Russians were that we're meeting? I'm sorry? Is part of your concern not just the fact that there were interactions, but who the particular Russians were? Uh, yes, it was uh, on both sides, um, yeah. The, not just the, the nature of the context and the, and the communicants. Or the, the yeah, and it's, it's not just the fact that they met. Right. You said, and I want to make sure I had your words correctly, um, you knew that meant there was, a, there was a basis to pull these threads. Can you elaborate on what that means generally? Well, frequently, and even totally divorced from the presidential election issue, if there are Russian, known or suspected Russian intelligence officers who seem to be cultivating contacts with U.S. persons, and there are reasons for... CIA or others to be concerned about what's happening there, we would make sure the Bureau is aware of it. We wouldn't know what those follow-up investigative steps were taken by the Bureau because of appropriate privacy rights and civil liberties of U.S. persons. But the Bureau has the primary responsibility in U.S. soil to follow its counterintelligence leads wherever they may go. CIA has very unique counterintelligence authorities as well. And we have a unique collection of authorities that make us the, I think, the, uh, the closest partner with the Bureau in this, in this matter, because we have the intelligence liaison relationships with our foreign service, sister services. We have covert action responsibilities. We have clandestine collection responsibilities and authorities. We have all source analytic capabilities, the best analysts in the U.S. government, uh, bar none. And so that combination of talent and capabilities is able to give the Bureau what they need. And that's why any type of suspicion that we have that something may be afoot here that the Russians are trying to get, and it's not just the Russians, it's other foreign services as well. We make sure the Bureau is fully apprised of that, and that's why we have FBI agents who are serving inside of CIA's uh, counterintelligence elements. Thank you. Switching topics here, um, Ms. Spear mentioned the um, sanctions and the, how they're impacting the Russians. Uh, you talked about how the Russians are attempting to get uh, avoid these sanctions of getting aid from others, but do they also use money laundering, correct? Uh, yes, they do. And can you elaborate just how extensive that is and where they're doing it primarily? I would, I would defer to some of the 
experts in uh, CIA as well as Department of Treasury and others, but money laundering is a, a long-practiced effort on the part of Russian businesses, Russian government officials and others, as well as Russian intelligence services in order to cover their tracks and be able to carry out uh, their illegal, illicit, even immoral activities. Uh, Avoid taxes, sanctions. I'm sorry? Avoiding taxes, sanctions. Oh, uh, avoiding any number of, of problems uh, for them, and they become very adept over the years at uh, money laundering. Are you familiar with which particular country or countries that they're principally involved with money laundering? Uh, I'm aware of some, but uh, again, I would defer to the agency at this time to identify the priority ones. Cyprus? They, they use uh, banking institutions um, in a number of countries. Uh, a lot of times what they're doing with some of the financial elements in countries is unbeknownst to the governments. And so uh, there are a number of uh, financial centers around the world that the, the Russians uh, have become quite active in. And I agree that the, the home country may not be aware and probably isn't aware of all that's taking place, but you would certainly be aware and concerned if there were U.S. persons involved with those financial institutions, correct? Anything that we might uh, uncover related to that, we would make sure that the Bureau of Department of Treasury and others are aware of it. They're the ones that need to follow up in, in terms of whether or not there's any criminal activity. And were there areas concerned in Cyprus involving this with U.S. persons and financial institutions there? Well, I think it's a well-known fact that uh, there is a large Russian presence, a large business interest, a large financial interest, the part of Russia in Cyprus. Uh, and so, uh, again, any type of involvement of U.S. persons or companies, uh, it would be the responsibility of, of the FBI and, and other U.S. agencies, not CIA, to follow up on that. Finally, if a U.S. president asked any intel official not to pursue an investigation, would you construe that as obstruction? Uh, I do not have the, the uh, a legal basis uh, to determine what uh, constitutes obstruction of justice. How would you react if a president asked you not to pursue an investigation? Uh, I have never been asked that, and if I was, I certainly would not. Uh, I would not follow such uh, a directive. Thank you. I yield back. Jim yields back. Uh, Mr. Turner, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Brennan, um, in turning back to um, uh, the. Um, exchange that you had with Mr. Gowdy. Uh, you stated, uh, and by the way, I, I want to also uh, uh, thank you, as others have, for the specificity that you provide to us. These are difficult issues and concepts, different standards, intelligence assessments, evidence. We've got uh, you know, the FBI, the CIA. Each of you do different uh, jobs, and uh, your expertise is certainly helpful to us to unwind, as we're dealing with elements of this, what what we're looking at and what this means as we try to move forward with an investigation. So you indicated um, that you saw, when asked about whether or not you'd seen evidence of collusion or collaboration, you said that you saw uh, intelligence uh, that indicated that there had been contacts uh, with individuals, uh, with, um, uh, with Russians, that were of a nature that bore investigation. Uh, you said that those contacts might have been benign, might not have been, uh, but they rose to the level of um, indicating that they need to uh, be reviewed for their nature and in looking into an investigation. Did I characterize that correctly? Yes, but I don't want to take this out of context. You know, we see contacts and interactions between Russian officials and U.S. persons all the time. It is when it's in the context that there's something else going on. And so we knew at the time that the Russians were involved in this effort to try to interfere in our election. So with that backdrop and increasing uh, indications that they were involved in that, seeing these types of contacts and interactions during the same period of time raised my, my concern. Excellent. I appreciate that, that, um, <clears throat> uh, that qualification. But if someone left this hearing today and said that you had indicated that those contacts were evidence of collusion or collaboration, they would be misrepresenting your statements, correct? They would have misheard my response to the very good questions that were asked of me. I'm trying to be as clear as possible in terms of what I know, what I assess, and what I, I can say. So you would say that's a misrepresentation of your statement, yes? I, I would say that it was not an accurate portrayal of my statement. Absolutely, Excellent. it was inconsistent with my so, so let me go to the next step. If someone saw what you saw, and only what you saw, with respect to those contacts, if they looked at the intelligence that you saw, where you said it might have been benign, might not have been benign, and then they characterize what they saw has been, as having been evidence of collusion or collaboration, 
they'd be misrepresenting the intelligence, would they not? I don't know what else they have seen that could corroborate or, cor if they or is saw correlated. They only what you saw. They would be misrepresenting the intelligence, correct? Uh, I, I, I presume they would be misrepresenting what it is that I uh, saw. Again, I don't Excellent. know. Thank you. I appreciate that because I do believe that there are members of this committee that deserve that counsel because your specificity gives us an understanding of what we're reviewing. And I do believe that there are those who review some of the information that you have, have seen and uh, represent it to the public absolutely incorrectly and misrepresent it. And I'd like to yield the remainder of my time to Mr. Gowdy. Sorry, I was uh, colluding with my uh, friend from <laughs> Florida. Uh, and I want to pick up where, uh, well, I want to do this. The last time you and I talked, you had referred information to the Bureau. Am I right? You had, you, what you had seen, you referred to the Bureau. Okay. What? I don't Is know it, if that was the last thing that we talked about, but I'll grant you that we one talked of them. about that. Yes. One of the last. Yes. It wasn't a trick question. One of the last things you referred to the Bureau, what you saw. Is that fair? Yes. Did you also refer to Director Clapper? Uh. Not everything that was shared with the Bureau was shared with uh, Director Clapper. And why would that be? Because uh, on counterintelligence uh, matters, dealing with uh, U.S. person information uh, of a very uh, sensitive nature, uh, the Office of the DNI and the DNI does not have that type of operational responsibility. And what we try to do is to make sure that there is as little exposure of that information as possible. I would keep General Clapper uh, informed about the nature of my uh, engagements, but uh, the materials that were shared with the Bureau would not have been shared with the, uh, the DNI. Do you know if the Bureau opened a matter? Well, first of all, when was that? With as much specificity as, as you can give us, when did you refer that information to the Bureau? Would you accept last year as the answer? <laughs> it was during the summertime and the... Okay. And, and, but even previous, there are ongoing, uh, ongoing sharing of information with uh, the Bureau, and so it was over the course of the, of the year. All right, in conclusion, because I'm out of time, sometime in the summer, you shared the information with Director Comey at the Bureau. Uh, sometime in the summer, there was information that the CIA had that was shared with the Bureau, but it wasn't the only period of time where such information was shared with the Bureau. Good enough. Thanks. Jim and Yost, Bagman, Swalwell, five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Director. Since you passed that information to the FBI, Director, have you reviewed the FBI's development of that evidence or any other evidence? I am unaware of what the Bureau has done with that information, and I have no knowledge of anything even that the agency has done since January 20th. Are you aware of what the Bureau has briefed this committee with respect to evidence of collusion? I uh, watched uh, Jim Comey's uh, hearing and his comments, and I've uh, gone through his transcript, so I'm aware of it, yes. Have you, are you aware of what the FBI has briefed this committee in a classified setting with respect to evidence of collusion? No, I'm not. Totally not. Director, May 10th of this year produced an unsettling image inside the Oval Office. President Trump standing and laughing with Russia's Ambassador Kislyak and Foreign Minister Lavrov. It's been further reported that President Trump shared highly sensitive code word information with Russia, putting at risk U.S. lives and jeopardizing sources and methods. Director, are the Russians worthy of receiving such information in the manner alleged? The I believe it's important for the U.S. Uh, intelligence to provide to any of our foreign partners any information related to terrorist threats to foreign countries or their citizens. And that's why I authorized the provision of classified information numerous times to the Russians that I believe saved Russian lives. As I mentioned, there is an appropriate manner and procedure for doing that. They need to be followed scrupulously so that there's not going to be uh, a undermining of those collection capabilities and systems. Director, you warned Bortnikov that there would be consequences if they meddled in our elections. When you look at that picture and the manner in which allegedly classified information was conveyed to the Russians, do you see consequences for their actions? Again, I don't know the totality 
of the actions that have been taken against the Russians. I know that, uh, again, the Obama administration in January took actions against them. Uh, so I, I, I believe that uh, depending on how this uh, investigation uh, proceeds uh, by, the, by the FBI and the special counsel as well as by the work of the committees, and I agree that the appointment of a special counsel should not in any way uh, stop these committees, uh, intelligence committees in the Senate and the House from doing its work because you're supposed to be looking at what, are, what do we need to do to strengthen our system so that we're better prepared uh, to it. So I, I believe that consequences need to be uh, levied on the Russians for it, but I would defer to policymakers in Congress to decide that. Director, with re respect to the contacts between Russia and Trump campaign persons that you referenced earlier, and whether they were innocent or benign contacts, when you see a multiplicity of contacts between one country and one campaign, when does it, in your mind, when you're deciding whether to refer it to the FBI, when does it move from mere coincidences to a pattern? And in this case, when did it? Um, I guess it's all sort of very sui generis as, as far as the instances are concerned, but uh, as I said, there was a backdrop there of uh, known Russian efforts to interfere in an election, and there were a variety of activities taking place that uh, wondered whether or not they were part of that campaign and strategy. Uh, we don't have a totality of uh, insight into all the things that the Russians were doing, uh, and um, I left it up to the professionals, uh, the counterintelligence and Russian experts, to make sure that whatever information that they deemed appropriate to share with the Bureau, because it could be relevant to their investigation, they did that. So I wasn't the one to make decisions, you know, share this with the Bureau, share this with. It was based on long held uh, practices on the part of the CIA to make sure that we're not holding back from our Bureau colleagues. Director, there is what is referred to as consciousness of guilt evidence. That's when somebody lies about a material fact, and that fact, the fact of them lying, can be used against uh, that person because it would be, in essence, uh, an effort to cover up what happened, meaning if, you know, you were telling the truth, uh, you wouldn't have anything uh, to cover up. With respect to some of the contacts that you've referred to between Russia and Trump campaign officials, are you aware of any of those U.S. persons who had contacts with Russia either making false statements about those contacts or failing to disclose those contacts? I think that's something that uh, you can, uh, <clears throat> we can pursue in uh, closed session. And, and, Director, with respect to the contacts that you have seen, have you ever seen in your history uh, working as an intelligence official this number of contacts between a foreign adversary and a presidential campaign? I think our collection systems have increased over the years, and so I don't know whether or not it's a result of better collection or because there were more contacts this time than not. I, I just do not have a basis to make a determination about that. Thank you. Yield back. Jeremy, yield back. To Dr. Winstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Brennan, for being here today and uh, your candor in this conversation. Have you ever been uh, asked to give your opinion to the FBI about whether intelligence you gathered should lead to an investigation? Do they engage you in that way? You said there's FBI engaged in the CIA, so I didn't know if they have an opinion or ask your opinion on that. Well, it, we, would, we would make a referral to the Department of Justice on, in many instances when we saw uh, classified information appear in the public in an unauthorized fashion. And so that referral is made to the Department of Justice to determine whether or not there should be a follow-up investigation. And it's the FBI that then takes a look at the circumstances uh, and makes the decision. So that would be the referral we make. Okay. And we've pretty much established that Russia and Soviet Union, they've tried to meddle with our elections for years. Now, you came in as director after the last election. Um, and which, which leads me to something Mr. Himes was talking about. He says, you know, the rules of the Russian playbook or whatever, they go, they try to build relationships, especially with influential Americans, and you would agree with that. That's one of the things that you're kind of looking out for, these relationships. At least I believe that's what you've said. So I'm just trying to understand process here a little bit. What sets up a red flag? What type of conversation do you hear 
that says, hmm, maybe we need to take a little bit further look into this or refer it on. And I can't help but think back to the previous election when we see on videotape President Obama says, this is my last election. After my election, I have more flexibility. And President Medvedev, who he's speaking to, says, I understand. I'll transmit this information to Vladimir, and I stand with you. Now, you talk about the playbook. It sounds like I stand with you. That's a pretty strong relationship. This is certainly an influential American, and we're talking openly about elections. So, again, I'm, just, I'm not trying to launch another investigation here, but I am concerned about the process. So you weren't sitting as a director at that time, but, you know, as Mr. Swalwell used the term, that's a pretty disturbing image, I think, to a lot of Americans, is what kind of relationship. So would you question this interaction uh, where that type of conversation is taking place? And again, I'm just trying to understand process of of how it moved from CIA to FBI to DOJ. It was a direct conversation between the, the heads of government and state between two countries. I'm, I'm not going to respond to your... Okay, but I or, think that's what we're... Ta- I'm just, again, trying to get an, some understanding of what sets off a red flag. Um, you know, and, and when do you refer to law enforcement? I know you weren't the director at that time. Um, but, boy, that just hits all the things you were talking about in the playbook. Elections, influential American, and building a relationship. I stand by you. So uh, just, tr- again, trying to, to get to the, the substance there. But I, um, that's interesting. You can't respond to a personal conversation, but this is what we're talking about. Anyway, with that, I yield back. I try to, again, I, go ahead. I try to avoid getting involved in political issues, partisan issues. Uh, and so with respect, Mr. Winstrup, I just will not uh, recognize that question. Well, thank you. And with that, I yield the remainder of my time to Mr. Gowdy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Winstrom. Um, Congressman Rooney and you were discussing uh, generally uh, the motive, and I think it is, let's just assume it's given um, that uh, the Russians did not like Secretary Clinton, did not like President Obama for that matter, and uh, desired uh, negative things for her. Um, but they also thought she was going to win. Was it your testimony that all of the information stolen um, was not publicly disseminated? No. I said if they had collected additional information, as I think was implied, that um, the, uh, the effort to try to uh, further hurt her uh, if she became president, uh, that information, uh, any type of derogatory information about her could have been husbanded for a uh, post-election period. All right. But do you know if uh, negative information was husband, to use your word, and not disseminate? Again, I, I, I think that would be uh, inappropriate to talk about in an, in an open session like this. Is it inappropriate to both? I, I get not asking you about the nature of it. Is it inappropriate to answer yes or no whether or not that information was husband but not disseminated? My, my uh, request would be that we could talk about that in closed session. Okay. I'll honor your request, and we'll talk about it in a little bit. Chairman Yosevac, Mr. Castro, five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Director Brennan, for your testimony here today. Uh, over the course of the last several months, the, the intelligence agencies have been berated by the president for the possibility of leaks. Uh, have you, are you aware of his tweets and other criticisms he's made about leaking in the intelligence agencies? I know that there have been a number of allegations made publicly about intelligence officials being responsible for those leaks. Yes, I'm aware of that. Uh, are you aware of a story that came out yesterday uh, that said, quote, Three White House staffers have been identified for leaking classified info. POTUS will fire, quote, multiple people when he returns to D.C. I'm unaware of that story or the facts, if any, underneath it. Uh, If the story is true, and we don't know whether it is or not, but if it's true uh, that there may have been people who leaked classified info at the White House, first, could you tell us, would... It seems like an obvious question, should be an obvious answer. Are there people at the White House that would have classified information that they could leak to journalists? White House officials, if they have the appropriate security clearances based on their position, they would have access to classified information, yes. Okay. And then the second part of that is, if the White House has determined that leaks are coming from within their operation, could you tell us how they would go about determining that? How would they figure out that they have leakers in the White House? If there is a a sense that there are unauthorized disclosures of classified information from within the White House, 
uh, I think it's imperative that the, uh, the FBI be brought into the matter so that there can be an appropriate investigation to determine whether or not that conduct was criminal or not. And uh, there shouldn't be just uh, an uh, independent investigation that takes place. Uh, they, can, they can do some uh, efforts to try to uh, contain any hemorrhaging of information, but uh, it really is the responsibility of law enforcement and the Bureau to investigate criminal leaks of classified information. Oh, thank you. Now, I have some questions about the IC assessment itself and the declassified report, because there has been a lot of disinformation and confusion about the intelligence assessment, and it's been attacked also. So, uh, Mr. Brennan, when did the IC start warning about the Russian threat, and how was the assessment produced? Do you believe that the people working on it had the requisite skills and expertise to write such an important assessment? Well, the intelligence community assessment that was produced in early January was um, initiated by President Obama in early December uh, to ensure that there was going to be a, a full accounting of Russian activities and uh, directed that there be a classified and unclassified version of that. Uh, the effort to uncover the Russian activities took place prior to uh, that. And in both instances, I believe that the right people with the requisite array of skills were involved in the initial collection effort and assessment effort about Russian activities uh, up to and even in the aftermath of the election in November. And then uh, there were... Uh, additional individuals who were added to that to a group that could draft that assessment so that it could be produced in early January. And let me ask you, um, how and why did all three agencies come to such a high degree of confidence about their assessment? I think that they rigorously um, interrogated the data, uh, had very careful and uh, uh, deep uh, discussions about uh, what the data told them about their assessments. And so, therefore, there was a, a unanimous consensus among the three agencies and the ODNI about the judgments. There was one variation as far as the NSA's confidence level in terms of the Russian advocacy for Mr. Trump. But uh, with that lone exception, uh, it was uh, a, a consensus uh, assessment. And the report also talked extensively about the role of WikiLeaks in working with Russia on this covert action campaign. Can you talk a bit more about how they fit in? Well, I think as the assessment says that the Russians used a cutout for uh, the WikiLeaks uh, exposure. And uh, when you look at the WikiLeaks releases over time, uh, you can see that uh, sometimes they are timed to coincide with certain events and they, I think, are always intended to undermine U.S. national security. And Russian protests that they are not working with WikiLeaks and WikiLeaks protests they're not working with the Russians, I think on um, both parts are disingenuous. Uh, and then let me ask my final question because I'm running out of time. Back to the leaking at the White House or potential leaking. Uh, what surveillance methods would the president or the White House have authorization to engage in on its own staffers um, that would be legal? And where might they cross the line? I am not a lawyer, and uh, you'd have to go to the Department of Justice and the FBI uh, in terms of what uh, statutory uh, authorities they might have, uh, which I, uh, I just am not aware. I don't know. Thank you, Director. Chairman Stiles, uh, Mr. Stewart, five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Director, for, again, your many years of service. I'm going to go very quickly because I want to reserve as much time as I can for our task force and the attorneys. I want to go through and make one point. It's a point worth making, but before I do, I'm just going to add that uh, I've reviewed the raw intelligence of the CIA regarding the analysis of whether they preferred Mr. Trump. I don't agree with the conclusion, particularly that it's such a high level of confidence I, I just think there should have been allowances made for some of the ambiguity in that, and especially for those who didn't also share in the conclusion that it was a high degree of confidence. But having said that, I do think we can agree that Russia wants a weakened U.S. president. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes. Yes, certainly. And in regards to Secretary Clinton, you have said that their primary goal seemed to be to, work, to weaken her candidacy so that she would be a weakened U.S. president. My question to you is, would the same thing be true now? Would Russia want a weakened U.S. President, Mr. Trump? Well, I think they, they want to be able to weaken U.S. Uh, policies, uh, especially on the international stage. 
I, I do think that there is an interest in the part of the Russians to improve relations with the United States. And I do think it's important that relations between Washington and Moscow be improved. Yeah. because. But, uh, but even if they want improved relationships, they would want that on their terms as much as able. And that would be better accomplished by having a weakened U.S. president, regardless of who it is. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say that's true? Uh, one can argue the point or that a, a stronger president is able to make, uh, have, have an accommodation with Russia uh, out of strength as opposed to out of weakness. Okay. I, I, I w would agree with you that there are some circumstances, but I think in general, they, a weakened U.S., a weakened U.S., uh, Western uh, influence in the world and a weakened U.S. president is in their interest. And I'll just conclude with this. These active measures, the propaganda, the false news reports, et cetera, they don't end with the U.S. election. And I think it's, it's appropriate that we would warn the American people that these active measures, again, propaganda, fake news stories, et cetera, would be uh, applicable today as well and that they would be trying to weaken our U.S. president and trying to weaken foreign leaders as well as we look at upcoming elections. Would you agree with that? Yes, generally okay, speaking, Thank you. Yes. And with that, I yield the remainder of my time over to, I believe, Mr. Gowdy. I thank my friend from Utah. Uh, Director Brennan, why is it important to protect the identity of U.S. persons as part of our surveillance programs? Because uh, there is, I think, a, a right of all Americans uh, to privacy. And that uh, sometimes information is collected about U.S. persons who may or may not be involved in any manner of criminal activity. And therefore, uh, respecting that privacy of U.S. citizens, uh, the intelligence community goes to great lengths to uh, cover the identities of U.S. persons if they happen to be included in an intelligence collection. Uh, for all those reasons and others, the, and, and again, we're not talking about leaks. We're talking about masking within the intelligence community, right? Is it, we're not talking about reading it on the front page of newspapers. We're talking about uh, prohibitions that you place on yourself with respect to identifying U.S. persons as part of our surveillance programs, right? That's correct. All right. Yes. And, and you just cited some of the very important reasons uh, that we do that. And I would assume that there is a process, a protocol under which the intelligence community goes through if they seek to unmask a U.S. person's name. That's correct. Have you ever requested that a U.S. person's name be unmasked? Yes, I have. Have you also... Uh, either approved or denied request of others that a U.S. person's name be unmasked? I don't recall in my tenure at CIA any decision on unmasking for someone else ha coming up to my level. It would have been, uh, that decision would have been made at a uh, lower level within the agency. Are you aware of any request within the community that were denied? I, I do not... I didn't have visibility into requests that were being made across the government, so uh, I, don't, I don't recall one uh, that uh, I was denied. Do you recall any U.S. ambassadors asking that names be unmasked? I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's ringing a vague bell, but I'm not, I could not answer with any confidence. Do you remember what your last day on the job was at the CIA? What was it, the date? It was noon on January 20th when I gave up my responsibility as director of CIA. On, ad, on either January 19th or up till noon on January the 20th, did you make any unmasking request? I do not believe I did. So you did not make any request on the last day that you were employed? No, I was not in the agency on the last day I was employed. Uh, I definitely know that on the last day I was employed, I definitely did not make such a request. Thank you, Director. Yeah, time has expired. Uh, Mr. Crawford, five minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Heck. Mr. Thank Heck, you, Mr. Minutes. Chairman. I just want to make sure you're awake down there, Mr. Heck. All over it, Mike. Right, Thank you, sir. Uh, Director Brennan, thanks for being here. I, I want to freely confess to you that there's an element to this Russian investigation with which I've struggled, and it is this. How do I explain why this should matter and why people should care? What words do I use to explain this to folks who have a lot of other things on their mind, things like their kids, like keeping their job, like managing their debt, like caring for an elderly parent? Why should people care that the Russians hacked into our computers and then selectively 
disclose that information with the express purpose of swaying an election? Why should they care that the Russians are doing this in other Western democracies and will continue to do so, by the way, at minimal investment? That's the precise question that I actually put to then Director Comey and Admiral Rogers when they were with us in March. I now pose it to you, sir. So not for my sake, but for America's sake. As someone who has devoted your entire life to public service, in your own words, please tell my constituents, my neighbors, why they should care, not just here in Washington, D.C., but in Washington State and Texas and Connecticut and points in between. Why should they care? Why do you care, sir? <clears throat> because for the last 241 years, this, this nation and its citizens have cherish the freedom and liberty that this country was founded upon. Many, many Americans, brave Americans over the years, have lost their lives to be able to protect that freedom and liberty. They've lost their lives also to protect the, the freedom and liberties of other countries and other peoples around the world. Uh, our ability to choose our elected leaders as we see fit is, I believe, an inalienable right that we must protect with all of our resources and all of our authority and power. And the fact that the Russians uh, tried to influence that election so that the will of the American people was not going to be realized uh, by that election, I find outrageous and something that we need to, with every last ounce of devotion to this country, resist and to try to act to prevent further instances of that. And so, therefore, I believe that this is something that's critically important to every American. It's certainly, I, it's very important to me for my children and grandchildren to make sure that never again will a foreign country try to uh, uh, influence and interfere in uh, the foundation stone of this country, which is uh, electing our democratic leaders. In other words, sir, because you love your country. That's the, uh, the cliff note version of it, yes. Well, I believe much is at stake here, including the following. Whether, American, well, whether America will have elections that we can trust, that are continuing measures of self-determination, free from foreign interference, whether we will smartly arm ourselves against any future such digital invasion, whether we are strong enough to make good on the promise to be a nation of rule by law, whether we will hold those accountable who seek to abrade our cherished institutions, whether we will stand up for democracy or enable this insidious autocracy and kleptocracy, much is at stake. No one should be misled, however, because this isn't just about Russia. This is about us and our metal. The famous American diplomat George Kennan said at the outset of the Cold War, much depends on the health and vigor of our own society. And indeed it does. We're being tested. We're divided. We've gone to our respective corners and claimed our own set of facts. Anger has become the currency of our civic discourse. Reason has been replaced with decibel level. But you know what? People also yearn for a reaffirmation of the value of narrative of America, which is the very thing that makes us great. That's what I hear when I'm home, whether I'm playing cards with my buddies or out to a movie with my wife, Paula, or having coffee in the narthex of church. And do you know why? Do you know why Americans yearn for this? It's because it's what makes us, makes it possible for us to be for something bigger than ourselves. And that is precisely what America is hoping, if not counting on us on this dais to do, to be for something bigger for ourselves and to put our country above party. And I pray that that's what we'll do. Thank you, sir, for your decades of service and for your presence here today. Thank you. Gentlemen, time has expired. Uh, Mr. Crawford, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will uh, yield to the gentleman from South Carolina. You may ask Mr. Gowdy. I thank my friend from Arkansas. Director Brennan, do you know who commissioned the Steele dossier? I don't. Uh, do you know if the FBI paid for any per a portion of the Steele dossier? I don't know. I know that there are press reports related to that, but I, ha I don't know. I have no first-hand knowledge of that. 
Do you know whether any of the uh, underlying allegations made in the Steele dossier were ever, ever tested, probed, examined, cross-examined, whether the sources were uh, examined for reliability, credibility? I know that there were efforts made by the Bureau to try to understand whether or not any of the information in that uh, was uh, valid, but I, I just I don't have any first-hand knowledge of it. Do you know if the Bureau ever relied on the Steele dossier as, any, as part of any court filings, applications, petitions, pleadings? I have no awareness. Did the CIA rely on it? No. Why not? Because we, we didn't. We, it wasn't part of the corpus of intelligence uh, information that we had. It was not in any way used as a basis for the intelligence community assessment that was done. Uh, it, was, it was not. All right, this is my last line of question. I hope I have waited sufficiently long enough to ask you about leaks to not inflame the anger of our friends in the media who think Republicans are hyper-focused on it, so we'll just do it last. Um, some of your colleagues have testified that our surveillance programs are critical, vital, indispensable to our national security. Do you agree with their assessment? Speaking generally, uh, yes, some of those programs are absolutely essential and vital to our national security. Do you agree that there is at least a tacit agreement between the American people and their government that they will allow us certain power, certain freedoms in exchange for safeguarding the privacy of the information collected? I, I think there is a, certainly an expectation that there would be uh, a protection of, of privacy as the government carries out its, its responsibilities, yes. And you and I discussed some of those privacy protections, even within the intelligence community, as it relates to U.S. persons. And you've been very clear this morning. In fact, I've, I've noted the times you've said U.S. persons. You could have inserted a name, but you did not. You had the discipline to say U.S. person. Uh, and that discipline is practiced throughout the intelligence community unless and until there is a request to unmask that U.S. person's name, correct? I would like to think that discipline is still exercised even if a request to unmask a name is made. All right. So we protect U.S. persons even within those like yourself and Director Pompeo and Admiral Rogers and Director Comey and the people that we trust – with awesome powers, we still impose some restrictions on them and that they have to request an unmasking. There has to be, I assume, a justification. You can't just wake up in the morning and say, hey, I feel like knowing who participated in X, Y, and Z. There has to be justification, right? Yes. All right. So how do we get from that to names being on the front pages of certain major U.S. newspapers? It's an excellent question. What would be an equally excellent answer? That somebody violated their um, oath to protect classified information and violated that oath and shared that information in an unauthorized fashion with members of the media. Well, my friend from Washington, and he is my friend, um, I, I was um, um, impressed not only with his eloquence, but the conviction with which he just spoke. Um, but I've got um, other colleagues, not from Washington, uh, that tend to minimize uh, the nature of leaks as if there is uh, somehow a weighing and a balancing that needs to take place between how interesting we may find the underlying information, how interesting we may find the underlying names. I have seen attempts, uh, unfortunately, by members of this very body uh, to mitigate and explain away and minimize what it does to the surveillance programs to have leaks of classified information. So I, I will finish with this. I, I believe there's some, some surveillance programs that are up for reauthorization. What, what would you say to the American people as names are unmasked on the last day that people are in office and classified information appears on the front pages of, of major U.S. newspapers? How would you tell your constituents Let's reauthorize this program again, despite the fact that we have abuses. How, how, help us make that argument when we go home. 
Mr. Gowdy, you and your colleagues here are going to have to make that argument uh, based on the merits of the program and the importance of it to our national security, as well as trying to send a reassuring message to them that if there have been any abuses of the accesses uh, to that information, either because of the number of people involved or those who were, in fact, uh, violating their oath of office, uh, that you and your colleagues will do everything possible to make sure you work with the executive branch to uh, minimize and mitigate uh, that uh, danger and that prospect. Time has expired. Ms. Stefanik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Director Brennan, for your service. My questions will be focused on the process and development of the intelligence community assessment. Um, as you know, the previous administration directed the intelligence community to produce a comprehensive intelligence report assessing Russian activities and intentions on December 9th. The unclassified version of that report incorporated information as of December 29th. In your experience as an analyst and as the director, what is the average time that it typically takes to produce an IC assessment? It, it can range from days to months to years, in fact, depending on the complexity of the matter, um, as well as the urgency of getting something out, it does uh, vary widely. So you, you noted that the complexity can have an impact on the timeliness to produce a comprehensive report. This report was produced in just 20 days in December. Was there anything about this interagency process that differed? The timeline, the approval process, the editing, or the staffing? I think it followed the general model of uh, how you want to do something like this, with some notable exceptions. It only involved the FBI, NSA, and CIA, as well as the Office of Director of National Intelligence. It wasn't a full interagency uh, community assessment that was coordinated among the 17 agencies. And for good reason, because of the nature and the sensitivity of the information, trying to once again keep that tightly compartmented. Uh, but in terms of the, the rigor and the, the analytic tradecraft, as well as the sourcing, uh, and as you, I think, know in the classified version, there it's extensively sourced, uh, it tried to adhere uh, to the, uh, the general standards. So at no point... Uh, there was never an individual within the administration outside of the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, or the DNI that reviewed, edited, or was part of the staffing process? Uh, not to my knowledge, um, but um, I wasn't overseeing the production process and the review process. The DNI was overseeing the production process? Or yes, it was a, a DNI produced assessment. So it's unclear whether anyone else on the NSC or the White House was part of the approval or review process from your, uh, from the knowledge that you have? They naturally would not have been part of a, you know, any type of review or editing process, no. What happened between December 29th, the date of the last information listed in the ICA, and January 6th when the report was published? Were there any additional edits or approval process outside of the norm? Uh, I think it was those last few days uh, were used to further refine. People worked over the, the holiday period, uh, but... Uh, I, Again, it was uh, trying to make sure that the products could be provided to the former president and the current president uh, in that first week of January. Um, as we know from your testimony, the Russian role in hacking in, of U.S. political entities was first reported in July 2016 and was publicly acknowledged by the IC in October of 2016. Why wasn't the intelligence community-wide assessment of these activities ordered until December? There were ongoing um, assessments that were done, and as I mentioned in my opening testimony, it was used to brief the senior most uh, government officials, as well as to ensure that the FBI and DHS could do what they needed to do to protect the, the, the government uh, institutions that were affected. Uh, and so, uh, again, there were periodic assessments as we were learning more through the process. It was additional detail. It also allowed us to um, uh, note that uh, we weren't seeing certain things that we were concerned about. And so the intelligence community assessment that was done in December, published in January, was the culmination of the, the work, the assessment, the collection that had taken place in the months before. For the record, it's of concern to me that um, there was a two-month lag for the administration to um, direct the DNI to um, produce a comprehensive report when um, this was publicly acknowledged as an issue uh, months earlier during the year. I want to touch upon um, 
the previous administration's actions on December 29th in response to the Russian government's harassment of U.S. officials and, and cyber operations, uh, which declared persona non grata 35 Russian intelligence operatives and the closure of two Russian compounds in the U.S. Did you recommend any action uh, to, the, to the administration prior to December 29th or prior to the November election? I, I, I wasn't recommending. Um, we had discussed what different options might be. So let me ask, for, it, it, did you um, suggest or present different options prior to the election or prior to December 29th to the administration? That's something that could be discussed in a closed setting. Thank you. My time has expired. I was about to, and I yield back. Uh, Mr. Hurd, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Director Brennan, I would like to join my colleagues in thanking you for your years of service, um, some of which we overlapped um, in the CIA, and I hope you are enjoying not getting late calls at night, um, and uh, you, looked, you, looked, you looked fresh. <laughs> my, my first question, and, and I apologize in advance for asking some questions about what did you know when at certain times. I have difficulty remembering um, what happened this morning, um, but nonetheless, I'm going to continue. In 2016, was collecting intelligence on foreign entities' attempts to influence our, le our election a collection priority? And when was that? Yeah. Um, last year in 2016. It, it, it was a collection priority, yes. It was. Yeah. So does that fall under the broader counterintelligence collection priorities of the, of the CIA? Uh, yes, counterintelligence as well as Russia collection efforts. What is ops intel? <clears throat> it's operational intelligence that is not um, maybe formally disseminated as intelligence community, but it is something of operational value uh, to, for example, an investigation. So prior to the um, the full accounting that happened in December 2016 of we're going to do a complete intelligence assessment. Um, was there any ops intel um, that was used or um, changed into intelligence actually disseminated to the broader community uh, during that assessment? There was an effort to make sure that all relevant intelligence that needed to be tapped for the drafting of this intelligence assessment was made available to the appropriate individuals, yes. So is it your understanding that there was information that was in operational channels that wasn't um, available to the entire analytical community and that was included in that December um, ultimately, the, the, the report that was dated January 6. I think as the, and again, I would defer to the folks at the agency, that classified intelligence report is exceptionally well documented and sourced. And just because something is produced as an intelligence report, it doesn't mean that it goes to everybody in the community. It is, there are recipient lists for that and depending on the sensitivity of the information, it is either broadly disseminated or very narrowly disseminated. One of the issues that this committee is focused on is figuring out what was the U.S. government's response to these Ru Russian active measures and what do we need to do to protect ourselves and our allies in the future. And one of my concerns is did we escalate soon enough? quickly enough? Did we notify those that were being targeted soon enough? And did we recognize the intelligence or the information that we had access to um, at the time that it was actually collected? And so my question is, knowing what you know now, would you have directed the CIA to do things differently? You know, I've asked myself that question. I feel as though we tried to do everything that we could to fulfill our responsibilities, which was to learn as much as we could about the Russian efforts, because uh, we didn't know, again, the extent of it. And so we had to be very careful about what we did so that we would protect certain capabilities in the community as a whole, uh, as well as to try to uh, assess um, what was happening. Uh, kept the, uh, the 
executive branch seniors informed, the National Security Council informed, the, the Gang of Eight informed. And so, um, you know, 2020 hindsight is always, you know, I think a lot maybe clearer to some folks. That's what I think this committee and the other committee and the, and the Senate is uh, going to take a look at. Uh, was it perfect? I don't think anything in this world is perfect, but I think we tried to do the best job that we could. So are we, is the intelligence community prepared or ready to counter covert action directed against us or direct measures as the Russians like to call that? How do we develop a strategy to counter covert action against us? And I, n I only have seven seconds, so I know that's difficult. And for that's you. why it's easy for me to say is refer to closed session as well as to current agency and other officials. Good copy. I yield back, Chairman. I do want to take this opportunity to say that I misspoke earlier in response to Mr. Gowdy. I was at CIA headquarters on the morning of January 20th. I went there to collect some final uh, personal uh, materials as well as to pay my last respects to our memorial wall. And uh, But I was there for a brief period of time and uh, just to take care of some final, final things that were important to me. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, Mr. Burton, uh, thank you very much. This is uh, We're at the end of our open hearing. Um, our committee is charged with uh, answering some really important questions. Uh, as some of my colleagues have said, our, uh, the success, the ultimate success of uh, the Russians' disinformation campaign and or active measures lies with the American citizens. Uh, and whether or not they're successful or not is up to us, up to us as citizens to, to, uh, to not let that happen. A part of that is how well we inform them of what happened and where, when, and what, what and all those kind of good things. And so thank you for being a part of that exercise this morning. Uh, we intend to have a closed session that will start in about 30 minutes downstairs in the spaces. We've got sandwiches available for you if you'd like. But with that, uh, we are uh, recessed until we get to closed sessions downstairs. Thank you very much.